Royal Stanley of Oregon Pacific Financial Advisors, offering securities through United Planners Financial Services member FINRA SIPC, guides clients with empathy in discovering and reaching their financial goals, and creates financial plans for clients so they can live their life by design. In these episodes, he relates his expert financial insights and discusses timely topics. Royal strives for excellence and has a passion for sharing his knowledge and supporting his community. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Life by Design with Royal Stanley of Oregon Pacific Financial Advisors. Royal, Happy New Year and I hear you have good news. I do. My wife and I, uh, mainly my wife, uh, we, we welcomed our son into the world uh, on November 30th. And, awesome. Uh, yeah, we're excited. I took most of the month of December uh, off and stayed at home, did a little bit of work, but for the most part, uh, let the, the team we've built here at Oregon Pacific uh, make sure our clients were taken care of uh, while I did that, which is wonderful to, to leave the uh, firm in such capable hands. So, uh, But it's good to be back in, uh, in the office. It's good to uh, start off uh, 2021. Um, and uh, put 2020 in our rearview mirror. Absolutely. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Uh, <laughs> putting that in the rearview mirror is is definitely something that I've been looking forward to. Not that the one-digit change really changed a ton, but at least it feels like a fresh start. And uh, I think the birth of a child is it's a huge kind of awakening to a fresh start, a whole new soul entering the world that is, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at some point, uh, maybe not right up, up, right up front, but man, to, to see through a small child's eyes, you don't, like, he doesn't know much of anything of 2020. Good for him. <laughs> he doesn't have to deal yes, with that. Yes, good for him. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what'll happen, I was thinking about it, is, you know, when he's learning about history, he'll be looking back and go, oh, I was, that was the year I was born. What were, what were my parents thinking, uh, bringing a child into the world that year? That's right. Well, you guys didn't have anywhere to go in February, right? I mean, something, like, something like that. You guys were locked down. So that's kind of yeah, how that works. Yeah. However that works. <laughs> yeah, however that works, yeah. 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 All right. So I know that uh, your son is a big theme of today's podcast. So what are we talking about? Yeah, I thought today what we could do is just spend some time and go over what parents, what grandparents should do when you add a new addition to the family. You know, either through uh, adoption or through uh, natural birth, just to kind of talk about what you should be looking at uh, and kind of taking a step back um, and making sure that you have certain things in place for the future for that child. Yeah, I, I think there are many, many things that are more important than coordinating the colors of a nursery that people need to consider. But I think that's, those are some of the first things we think about is, okay, what am I going to need physically for the baby? What colors are we getting? You know, all these other things, but... There are some things that I think that are much more important, and that's I know that that's what you're covering. That's right. That's right. You know, I think there's there's a lot of things we we suddenly want to consider there where we add a a, um, a child to a family, and especially I think on the the first child, uh, that's where it becomes mm-hmm. very real. Of um, okay, what do we need to do? And then when you add a second, then it's like okay, well, what else do we need to do? So uh, I just want to take some time, kind of go over that and. Um, just hopefully give some people some perspective uh, as they add a family member on some of the things they should look at or consider uh, doing to, you know, really make sure they're, they're uh, providing the best possible care for that child's future. All right. So I thought we would begin with really planning for the worst. <laughs> oh, so you okay. have a new child and then you, you step back and go, and it, it always strikes me as funny. Uh, you know, this is my second child, and it, it always amazes me that y- you go to the hospital, the, the child's born, you have the nurses there, they help you for a day or two, and then there's that realization of these people are just going to let me walk out of this hospital with this child, and I hmm. can't come back. <laughs> um, you know, this child is all my responsibility now. So you have to ask yourself, well, what happens if I'm not there anymore? What happens mm. to, to myself or to my spouse? Uh who do I want to take over the responsibility of raising and rearing, rearing a child? Uh, and that's a really personal conversation that uh, you and your partner should have, or if it's just you, you, sh- you need to kind of consider who's capable for taking over um, kind of th- those parenting roles. Uh, should anything happen to you as a parent? Mm. Yeah, that, that's a big decision. It is a big decision. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about what happens um, 
should you not do that planning? You know, if you're a um, married couple, you know, you're, you're, you're together and something happens to one spouse, that's pretty easy. The, the surviving spouse will take over. But, um, you know, if you're a single parent or if something were to happen to the both of you, you need to have the estate planning documents in place and updated uh, to really spell out who's going to take over both the kind of day-to-day care of the child as well as who's going to take over the financial responsibility for your estate to provide for the child. Mm-hmm. They can often be the same person, some some lawyers, uh, and some people just want to separate those two uh, and kind of create a firewall there so you're not giving too much responsibility to any one person. So these are some of the things we need to consider. If you don't do that planning, then it gets left up to the surviving family members and the court system to start making those decisions on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And that starts to create, I think, a lot of worry there and can really tear families apart. They try to figure out what was the wishes of, of my son or daughter or what were they together. So the first thing you want to do is look at your estate planning documents. And when I say estate planning documents, I'm really talking about your will. Um, your will is going to be the place where you line out who you want to take over responsibility for your child, who who do you want to uh, take over responsibility for your estate, uh, and the care financially of that child. You might have a trust as well. That could be something else you're, you're looking at. Uh, we don't see too many uh, young people who are kind of a, uh, 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 child rearing, uh, age who need a trust. So oftentimes it's, well, but you might have a trust, um, that lines out, okay, what happens? Who takes mm-hmm. over? So you really want to consider that you want to start having those conversations. I would say early, you don't want to be having those conversations, you know, when God forbid there's a health change or something like that, kind of start spelling out who do you want to, to step in? Should anything happen to you? Yeah. And, and like you said, if, if you don't, then, the state will will have to make those decisions, right? And and each state is different. So I know that you work with people in a, a large number of different states. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know some states will say that the children are going to be in the care of the closest relative in proximity, not necessarily closest relative relationally, right? I mean, mm-hmm. as far as like who has a great relationship with the child, it could be, you know, your deadbeat brother-in-law that or your brother that is two miles away from you and all of a sudden they're going to be in charge of your children. <laughs> it's not, maybe not the most ideal situation. So, and then there's just, you know, all sorts of battles that would have to happen within the court system, especially if, uh, you know, maybe that family member is opportunistic and thinks that there's going to be um, some money associated with it. So it, it's just never a good idea to leave the decision in somebody else's hands when, it, when clearly you have the ability to make it your decision. A- absolutely. Absolutely. And nobody likes to plan for the worst. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's never on anybody's kind of a, uh, top list of things to do on a uh, lazy Sunday, but it's definitely a priority when you uh, start to have kids is getting that will in place to line out what you want to have happen. Yeah. And th- so I'm going to ask you the flip side of the coin, not, not actually even the flip side of the coin. We're going to add another coin to the pile. When you have a second child, how should you be reviewing or updating those? So it really depends on um, uh, how you have your will structured there. Uh, a lot of times what will happen is when they when they do a will or these uh, trust documents is they will provide for additional children being born. Um, oftentimes the existing child will be named and then uh, there'll be reference to any additional children. This is what happens. What I would do is uh, if you have an existing will that uh, mentions um, you know, what you want to have happen with your children, just take, pull it out, take a look at it, make sure it still applies. You don't necessarily have to go back to the attorney to have that updated, to have that second or third child added by name. Uh, although, you know, after about five years, we recommend people really go back to the attorneys and, and have those wills updated, uh, anyway. So maybe just kind of add that to your list of, of, uh, to do's when you go back in for that, uh, attorney review. And, and some attorneys might disagree, say, you, you got to name it in there. Um, but uh, for the most part, I think if, if the attorney has put in provisions for any additional children, um, that should suffice until you kind of hit your next uh, five-year review update for a will. Yeah, and, and five years is a large amount of time. Um, it may not seem like that when it comes to the children, but 
what about the people that you have entrusted to help with those children? It, five years can change a lot of things in their life. Are they still appropriate? Uh, are they still capable and able? Are they still willing? I mean, th- those are a lot of questions that people need to be reviewing on a, on a regular basis. Uh, that's an excellent point. Yeah. If, if there's a change to who you're naming, you, you need to get in there and uh, make those changes. Oftentimes, I think the default is the grandparents, and that mm-hmm. can be an excellent default. That can be a lot of stress, especially if there's a health change there or uh, a change to uh, their financial situation uh, where they're just not able to do that anymore. So just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind as you're you're planning for your child's care should something happen to you or your spouse. Yeah, absolutely. And the Royal, just on a personal note, that's kind of what my wife and I's situation was uh, years ago is that it was grandparents that were you know, going to be able to take care of the kids. If something were to happen to both of us, tragically, we had all the finances in place that they would not have to worry about any financial burden. Um, but five to seven years into that, uh, agreement, I noticed that with my, with my parents, because with my parents specifically, there would have been a, a physical toll that would, would be difficult for them to deal with. Now the like I said, financially, they would have been fine because we would mm-hmm. provide for that. But you can't account for how much stress it would be to have two younger children under 10 uh, with g- grandparents, specifically that one was having health issues and uh, the amount of stress and, and uh, on their life it wouldn't have been fair to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so definitely something you want to revisit, um, you know, as that situation changes, because you know, it, it, it's your kids. It's, it's mm-hmm. what you care the most about. And, and don't leave these things to chance. Yeah. Um, that, that would be my, my biggest recommendation is don't leave these things to chance. You know, come up with the best solution, um, you know, should the worst happen. All right. So we've talked about that. What's next? So the next piece of this is looking at your life insurance. And especially for a younger couple, probably um, maybe just start out. They may, they may not have looked at life insurance at all or are just relying on their employer-provided life insurance mm-hmm. policies for protection of their spouse. Uh, and, and that can be okay in some situations, but once you add a child into the mix, all of a sudden your future obligations uh, financially have increased dramatically. Yes. You know, um, it's an older statistic, but they basically said, you know, to take a child from uh, cradle to... Uh, 18 years old, it's about a, a quarter of a million dollars is what you need. That statistic's pretty old. And if, as we look at the skyrocketing cost of colleges uh, and uh, inflation, um, you know, you're probably going to need to set aside a, a, a quite a bit more. The other thing we want to look at there is, you know, if, if you are a married couple, protecting the spouse and giving that spouse the ability to who stay at home if desired. Um, should something happen to um, one of you. The issue becomes is, oh, well, well, uh, my wife can just keep working and everything will be fine. Uh, being a single parent and having that as a, a requirement that you have to do to keep things going uh, is an ideal, mm-hmm. uh, especially with a child. I don't think anybody is, is going to wish that on their spouse. So uh, at, at you know, childbearing age, Life insurance, especially term policies, are extremely cheap. So when a child is born or, you know, during kind of the pregnancy, that's really where you want to do an evaluation there and say, what do we need to add uh, to protect the family uh, should anything happen? And I think the mistake I see most often, often there is, well, my wife doesn't work, so she doesn't need life insurance. Um, you know, she's not working. She's not providing any value. Uh, to the household, um, I would really strongly push back on that because when you have a stay-at-home spouse, they are working, you know, 24 hours a day taking care of a child, um, you know, providing care mm-hmm. and support. You're, you're not going to be able to work 40 or 50 hours a week and then uh, go home and care for that child. You're going to need more flexibility and that's where life insurance can can step in and fill that gap and give you more options and possibilities uh, to take care of your family. So life insurance, I think, is just a critical, critical piece of this. Um, and once again, something that people aren't just considering as part of, I think, the obligation of having children is, what happens if I'm not here? How do I protect them? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I know that there's been numerous things written about it, but thinking about all the different jobs a stay-at-home spouse does, um, mm-hmm. they, there's been articles that have put dollar amounts to you know the home care, child care, so on and so forth. Uh, just think about that person being gone. If you have a child that's younger than school age, now you need full-time care uh, for the child unless you're going to completely stop working, which then you have to replace the income that you had. Um, or if they are of school age, you still need to figure out how you're going to take care of before school and after school care. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, you know, th- those are all expenses. And like you said, coming home after 40 or 50 hours, you're going to be wiped out. Are you really going to be able to maintain everything that you need to maintain? So there's a lot of things people just don't consider. Right, right. And I think the other thing they don't consider is how their priorities are going to change mm-hmm. should they lose a spouse and become a single parent. Yeah. Um, because I think that's that's a... Uh, complete reshuffling of the deck of your priorities in your life when something like that happens. So having the life insurance and the ability to um, really make new decisions about how you want uh, the the child raising years that you have left uh, to look like, it's really important to have that flexibility. And, you know, like I said, if you're in your 20s or 30s or, um, you know, even a little bit older in your early 40s, um, life insurance is very cheap if you're just looking at a 10 or 20 year term policy. So, um, a, as far as how much you need, you know, that's what a, a good financial advisor and financial planner can help you with is dialing in, Hey, here's how much you need for this period of time. Mm-hmm. You know, you probably won't need as much insurance, you know, when the kids are, uh, in college, you know, yeah. so a 10 or 20 year policy can, can really protect the family and, and just not cost that much. Mm-hmm. Agreed. So the next things that uh, we start looking at uh, for a, a new child is we start that kind of long-term uh, plan there of, okay, well, at some point, the hope is, is this child is going to want to go on to uh, uh, college. Mm-hmm. Now, everybody has, I think, a, a lot of different views about what college looks like and if is that appropriate for my child. They don't want to necessarily put too much pressure on a child. So But I think it's something that we we need to start planning for. I think most parents want to be able to give their child at least something uh, to get started with, whether that is a a nest egg for college or a nest egg for a first home. When a child's born, you have a opportunity there that you're going to lose over time, and that opportunity is time itself. Mm -hmm. You know, if you start putting away a hundred dollars a a month for college or twenty five or fifty when a child's uh you know one year old or two years old that gives you a lot of time for that money to accumulate uh if you say oh well let's not worry about it let's put that off it gets much harder to save a significant sum mm-hmm. when a child's twelve or thirteen and you your window now is limited to about five years before college so we encourage people to kind of take a look there and start factoring in, um, okay, what, 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 what do I want, want the future to look like for my kids? You know, do I want to prioritize college? Uh, the caveat there I would have is a lot of things are going to change with college, I think, over the next 10 or 20 years as we go through a student debt crisis and people start reevaluating um, why a four-year degree is valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think we've been told that for a long time and uh, not everybody, I think, is going to continue to believe that. Um, so we want to have some flexibility there uh, to kind of make new decisions as we go along. So maybe college uh, savings account isn't the right option, but there's a lot of different options that we can look at that provide more flexibility for people um, when planning for their kids' future. So those are kind of the three big things I just wanted to touch on for new parents is number one, um, estate planning documents. What mm-hmm. happens if you're not here? Number two is really uh, the, the carry on to that is how do you how do you make sure financially that your kids are taken care of? And that's really through life insurance. Uh, and then finally, start planning for your child's future and what that's going to look like um, down the road, whether that's college or first car or first home or starting a business. I think a lot of parents would love to be able to give their kids um, you know, that, that first uh, head start uh, in starting their own lives and uh, hopefully leaving the nest before the age of 30. 
That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and here's the thing is that you've already spoken on previous podcasts about college savings, uh, the, the, the different options there. So I, I want people to, to go back and listen to those podcasts um, where you've spoken more in depth about it. But one of the things that I remember us talking about was the flexibility that people have. And, and I bring that up because I think in this COVID world, as we're calling it this moment, a lot of things did change, right? A lot of things, mm-hmm. a, a lot of thoughts about college have changed. And um, my son personally did not go to college because it was not something that he desired. He became a mechanic at 18. Actually, I think it was almost the end of his 17th year, I would say. He started in on it. And he loves it and he loves working with his hands and he's a good mechanic. Um, but if I had, you know, the ability to save up some money, it would have been nice to have gifted him with a little bit of cash to be able to buy the tools he needs because he's buying them as he goes, but every mechanic needs those things. And so whatever industry your child decides to get into, if they decide not to go to college, that money can be used to help get them further in that industry, whatever that is. Um, Mm -hmm. I I love the fact that you brought that up on a previous podcast. I just wanted to highlight that because I think a lot of people think that if I do a college savings plan of some kind, then they have to use it for college. They have to use it in a specific way. And that's just not the case. You covered that before. So um, Mm -hmm. if anybody has thoughts or questions about that, I know that they can reach out to you and your team. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, give me a call at uh, 541-772-1116. Uh, or just visit our website at opfa.com. All right, Royal. Happy New Year, man. Congratulations. I mean, that's so exciting. You still owe me pictures. I'm just going to say that on the podcast so it's recorded. <laughs> and I'm hoping your wife listens to this because Royal yeah. owes me a picture of that baby. Um, you know, as a grandparent, not to your child, of course, but <laughs> as a grandparent, I love babies. So, because they're not mine. And I can, you know, I can say, hey, a beautiful baby and, and have fun for the next 18 years to 20 to 30, possibly, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, you, you can hold it for as long as he'll let you and then just hand it right back. That's right. That's right. It's the beauty. All right, Royal, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, my pleasure. Good to talk with you. Absolutely. Same here. And of course, last thank you goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Life by Design podcast with Royal Stanley. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Royal comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And if you follow Royal on social media, or if you go to the website, I'm sure that you can email him and bug him for a picture of that baby too. I don't know if he'll send it. <laughs> That's right. You, That's you right. go ahead and request it. <laughs> Again, <laughs> thanks for listening today. For everyone at Oregon Pacific Financial Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Life by Design podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The views expressed are those of the presenter and may not reflect the views of United Planners Financial Services. Material discussed is meant to provide general information and is not meant to be construed as specific investment, tax, or legal advice. Individual needs vary and require consideration of your unique objectives and financial situation. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Advisory services offered through Oregon Pacific Financial Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through United Planners Financial Services of America, member FINRA and SIPC. Oregon Pacific Financial Advisors, Inc. and United Planners Financial Services are independent companies.